Well, if you got your message notes out, I want to invite you to pull those out. We're beginning a brand new series today, and this is going to be a very important series for our church and for many of you because I've, I want to help you. And the series is titled Bless, and here's the working definition. This is my heart for you as your pastor. Bless means endowed with divine favor and protection. I want there to be a God factor on your life. I want there to be a favor and a protection covering your life, your business, your career, your marriage, your family. Having more than enough. God's plan for you is to have more than enough. God's plan for every single one of you is to have more than enough. One of the most unhealthy and unbiblical things I have heard in Christianity over the years is God wants to give you enough to meet your needs. No, he doesn't. God does not want to give you enough to meet your needs because if all God does is give you enough to meet your needs, how are you going to help your neighbor? How are you going to be a blessing? How are you going to make a difference in other people's life? If all you have enough for is you, how are you going to make the difference God has called you to make with your life? God wants you to live a life of more than enough because he has a plan for you. He wants you to make a difference. He's got things for you to accomplish, having more than enough material, emotional, and spiritual resources. And then here's my favorite part, living stress-free. This is what I want for you more than, because some of you are, are, are stressed out right now. And the number one cause of stress in America today is financial stress. It's the number one cause of stress. I look at the prayer cards that we get on a regular basis, the stress, the anxiety that people are going through, and it's all connected to finances. It's connected to a career, a salary, a business, unemployment, a home that hasn't sold, a business that is not there. It's financial stress that is killing people. Credit card debt right now is at an all-time high in America. The Federal Reserve says there is $1 trillion, T, not B, trillion dollars of credit card debt in America right now. It is killing us as a country. It's killing us. They say one out of every four Americans doesn't have one dollar in emergency savings in case something goes wrong in their life. Not even one dollar. One out of four Americans. Depending on what poll you look at, financial stress is either the number one to the number five cause of divorce in America. Some polls listed it as the number one cause of divorce. Some polls have it two or three or five. But it is up in the top five as one of the biggest contributors to divorce in America. Financial stress is killing families, it's killing marriages, it's killing people. Some of you feel it. You're drowning in debt. You're suffocating. It's, it's overwhelming. Doctors are telling us that financial stress produces depression and anxiety. Financial stress contributes to migraines, ulcers, digestive issues, high blood pressure, and even heart attacks. Financial stress contributes to disrupted sleep patterns. You can't sleep at night because you're staying up stressed out over money. Well, as your pastor, I want you to be blessed. I want you to live stress-free. And there is a way to handle money, a biblical God way of handling money where you can live your life without financial stress, where you don't have to have this as one of the issues and challenges of your life, but you can live stress Free, and we'd love to help you. Let me, let me share a story to begin with of a family in our church. This is a family who came to our church a few years ago. They found Christ in our church. They went through one of our financial stewardship small groups. And, and let me just read to you their story. They said, I wanted to share our testimony of God's gift to release us from the chains of credit card debt and how we celebrated when we finally broke free. For 20 years, I can't even imagine that. Can you imagine living with credit card debt for 20 years of your life? For 20 years, we carried the burden of credit card debt. We both came into our marriage with debt, and that continued to grow. We assumed that we would carry this burden forever. Coastline gave us the opportunity to first learn about tithing. Having never learned about it before, the lessons were eye-opening, and we were nervous about diving in. We were feeling weighed down by our debt, and we could not wrap our minds around living on only 90% of our income when we were barely making ends meet with 100% of our income. In September of 2015, we dove in and began tithing. Through God's goodness, we were able to continue living without making big financial changes and not miss the 10%. In September of 2017, we heard Pastor Larry Stockstill 
give a message at Coastline, and during which he spoke about the Surge Project, a global church planning initiative. The most surprising thing about planting a church was that it was not an outrageously expensive commitment. In the fall of 2017, we participated in the Stewardship Small Group. In this group, we learned so much about handling our finances God's way. It was here where we first felt that breaking our credit card debt chains could actually become a reality for us. Throughout the next two years, we went through some job changes, each one allowing us to get closer to eliminating our credit card debt along with other changes we were making in our budgeting. During this time, we had conversations about the idea of planting a church. We decided that once our credit card debt was eliminated, we would celebrate by planting a church. We broke the debt chains in March of this year, and for, I think it was $3,500, we were able to plant a church in Honduras that same month to celebrate getting debt free. We can't wait to see how God is going to use this church to further His kingdom in Honduras. Can I tell you, it is possible. It is possible. You may feel like you're drowning. And again, I don't want anyone to walk out of this message today feeling shame or feeling guilt because of financial situations you have wound up in. There is hope. We have people who love to sit down with you, financial coaches, uh, stewardship, small groups that will walk you through just like this couple to find a reality that many people today don't even believe is possible. And this is God's heart. God wants you to live blessed. Here's what God says in Genesis 12, and this is the Abrahamic covenant. This is the covenant that you and I are under today. We are children of Abraham as New Testament Christians, and this was spoken over Abraham long before the Old Covenant was established, before the law of the Old Testament was ever written. This was God's heart for mankind. This was, this was God's plan all along. Here's what he says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. That's us. We are the nation that God formed Abraham into. We are the New Testament church. He says, I will bless you. This is God's heart for you. God wants to bless you. It's his desire to bless you. This is what he's planned all along. We got to get rid of this idea that God wants us broke and struggling, and that's the way we, we, we are holy. There's this warped thinking in a lot of churches today that, that if I'm struggling in poverty, I'm somehow holy because being rich and being blessed and being prosperous can't be you know, God's will for my life. No, God says it clearly. I want to bless you, but there's a purpose. There's a reason why God wants to do this. He says, I will make your name great, and here's the reason, and you will be a blessing. I can get you out of debt so you can be a blessing and plant a church in Honduras. I can bless you with, with more resources to do more things for the kingdom, and you will be a blessing. Now, here's the problem. For years in Christianity, anytime people taught on money, it was very unhealthy and it was very unbiblical. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, all of that money teaching you saw on Christian television, which was just a load of garbage, it was this whole philosophy of give to get, give to get, give to get. You give, send your $9.99 in to this television evangelist, and you're going to get $999 back in the mail supernaturally from God. It's a load of garbage. I mean, God is not sitting in heaven thinking to himself, I'm so glad all of my children are getting a revelation of getting. They're becoming great getters. No, the biblical model is give to give. God wants to bless you so that he can make you a blessing. So, so there's a reason why we're doing this series. And what I want to do today is I want to build the foundation. I want to make the case for why this is important for all of us to understand. I'm going to have you three points today to build the case for the series. Here's the first one. If you're going to live a life that is blessed, you need to understand there are two legs of living blessed. There, there are two very different legs, very different things that you stand upon if you want to be blessed. Now, now here's why this, this is a big deal for us. For years, I've taught The Blessed Life in our church. The Blessed Life was an incredible book that Pastor Robert Morris in Dallas, Texas wrote, and it really helps people understand. They get a revelation of generosity and tithing and giving, but that's only one part of living a blessed life. And what Pastor Robert assumed and what I oftentimes assumed is people understood the other part. 
And what we're beginning to realize is there are many people in my church, in his church, I've gotten emails recently, up into this week I got an email from somebody in our church. He said, listen, I'm tithing, I've got the revelation of giving, but I'm still struggling financially. I'm still living in stress financially, and I can't figure out why you know, God, is, God is blessing, but we're still strapped. Like, like I'm trying to pull myself out, and what we realized is there's a whole other leg to living the blessed life that we need to deal with, that we need to talk about. And so Robert actually wrote a new book called Beyond Blessed, which is the prequel, even though he just wrote it, it's the prequel to The Blessed Life. We're going to have copies of each book available next weekend free of charge. I highly encourage you to read them. It's a very easy book to read, but it's a, but it's a very helpful book of understanding what is, what is God really saying. I'm going to give you kind of the cliff notes over six weeks, but if you want to go deeper highly encourage you to read the book. There's two legs to living a blessed life. The first leg is generosity. God God is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? And God wants his children to look like him. And so we need to understand generosity, giving freely, open-handedness. Here's what the Bible says in Acts 20. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. The words of Jesus, it is more blessed Blessed, this is my heart for you. This is God's heart for you. To be blessed, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to be generous. And the word blessed here, if you study it in the original language, the Bible, the New Testament was written in the original Greek. This is the Greek word makarios, which is literally translated happy. Jesus is saying you'll be happier if you're a giver. You'll be happier if you're generous. And it's true. Anytime you've hung out with a generous person, they're always the most joyful people to be around. Like It's so much fun to hang out with generous people. But the whole idea of generosity is just one part of the blessed life. There's a whole other component to what it means to be blessed that we want to spend a lot of time in this series looking at, and it's stewardship. What is stewardship? It's the careful and responsible management of somebody else's property, or finances. Let me put it like this. How many of you have ever stayed in a friend's vacation home? Like you had a friend, they had a vacation home, and, and, and you went and stayed. And how many know it's miserable? Like you don't relax at all. Like yeah, it's cheaper, but you don't enjoy it at all because you don't put your feet on anything. You like keep everything clean. You make the bed every morning. You got to make sure nothing's broken, and, and, and you're spending hours and hours and hours. Just go stay in a hotel. You're going to feel so much more relaxed. Like, why do we do that when we stay in a friend's vacation home? Because we know the owner. We know it's not ours, and so we're trying to take care of it because we know it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to a friend. That's what stewardship looks like. And see, this is in the very first chapter of the Bible. Look at the very first chapter of the Bible. Genesis 1, it says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then look at this, God created bless them. God wanting to bless you, it can't get any more beginning than chapter one of Genesis. This is God's heart from the very beginning. Jesus put it like this in the New Testament, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. God's heart is to bless us. God's passion is to bless us. And look at his first command to mankind, be fruitful and increase. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to increase. I want you to grow your wealth. I want you to grow what you have. Why? Because again, there's a purpose to it. It's not just for our benefit. It's not, God's not trying to feed our selfishness or feed our materialism. There is a purpose for all of it. And then he says, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over earth. You're supposed to be in charge of earth. Here's the problem. In America today, we've gotten this backwards. Because what we're seeing in America right now is not us subduing the earth. We see the earth subduing us. What do I mean? We're slaves to the credit card. We're slaves to debt. We're slaves to money. We're supposed to subdue everything in this earth, and yet the things of this earth are now subduing us, and we're living into to the bondage of debt, slavery to credit cards, slavery to interest payments, but, but because, of, because of things that we really didn't need, trying to impress people we really don't like. And instead of us subduing the earth, the earth is now subduing us. We've gotten it backwards. 
He goes on to say, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and of every living creature that moves on the ground. Our job is stewardship, management, responsibility to rule over the world. Now, here's the thing. Stewardship is easy once you figure out the ownership question. Here's the ownership question. David says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's all God's, all of it. The world and its people belong to him. Let me put it like this. The car you drove to church in today came out of ore that God owns. The wedding ring on your finger came out of a piece of coal that belongs to God. The home that you live in came from trees that God owns. It's all his. We simply steward over what he owns. Like, we, it, it may have our name on it, but don't ever, don't ever get the idea that it's yours. It all belongs to him. And see, here's, here's the picture of, of living blessed. To live a blessed life, you got, you got, I want you to think of the human body. You need two legs to adequately move forward. If all I had was one leg in life, it'd be hard to get around all that. Like, it, it would be a challenge. It would be difficult. I need two legs to adequately move forward. One leg is called generosity. One leg is called stewardship, and you need both. You don't want one without the other. See, here's what happens. If I'm incredibly generous, but I'm not a good steward, God's not going to open the windows of heaven for me because I'm not going to manage it correctly. I'm not going to manage it wisely. But at the very same time, if I'm a good steward, if I'm smart with money, but I'm not generous, then I'm stingy and God can't trust me with more because he can't get it through me. You see, God's trying to accomplish something here on earth. Let me put it like this. Here's the need. God sees the need. There there are starving kids in Africa. There are people who are flooded out in Arkansas. There are buildings that need to be built to serve children and to serve youth. There's gospel that needs to be preached, missionaries that need to be sent, translations of the Bible that need to be financed. There is a need in the world, and God sees the need, and he cares about the need. Now, here's the good news. God has all of the supply. Everything God needs to meet the need, he owns. He owns it all. He's got full supply. He's got all of the resources. He's got everything it takes to meet the need but there's something missing from the equation, and it's you. It's you. How does God work on earth? He always uses his children to move the supply to the need. Always. Always. God's not writing checks from heaven. God uses his children to get the supply to the need. God channels his resources through his children, and if he can't get it to where it needs to go through you, then he'll find somebody he can So if you have part of the supply and he's trying to get it over here to the need and and, and something's blocking it, then he'll he'll go find somebody who will make sure they're going to be a channel and get it to where it belongs. But again, it takes generosity and stewardship. The problem for some of us is we want to give, we want to be generous, but all of our supply is going to credit card payments. All of our supply is going to debt service and interest and and, and just foolish spending priorities. And so our supply isn't getting to the need because we're we're drowning over here and we've got to get control. And here's what Jesus says about it. He says, there we go, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, we're talking about money here. We're not talking about talent, potential, and ability. We're talking about money. If you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches, which is the lives of people? So the reason for this series, there are many people in our church over the last couple of years who've really got the revelation of tithing and giving and generosity, but they're still struggling. They're still struggling. Why? Because they, they haven't fully caught stewardship. They haven't caught handling God's possessions God's way. And so we need to deal with things like debt and credit. What does the Bible say about credit cards and buyer's remorse and, and debt? And I'm telling you, we've got great, we got great small groups, stewardship groups to help you, financial coaches to help you. I don't want anyone feeling guilt or shame with this series. All of us, my, my wife and I, 10 years ago, were in a horrible position financially from some really dumb choices we made and wound up in a lot of debt. And it took, it took four years of us 
you know, working very hard, getting help, asking for help, living off a budget, cutting things out of our life to be able to get debt free. It wasn't easy, but it was possible. And I can tell you story after story after story after story of people in our church who have been through the stewardship groups and have found themselves debt free. It is possible, but you've got to take the first step. You've got to get help. You've got to ask somebody. And I know there's shame involved, but we've got to figure this out. Like, you know, we need stewardship. My son, my son Asher is now 11 years old. Uh, he's incredibly generous. Like, we did really, really, really good teaching him generosity. We didn't do so well teaching him stewardship. We're still working on that part right now. But the generous side, he's got down. Like, like he loves to give. Like, he'll, he'll take his allowance to school and come back with nothing. We're like, where'd your allowance go? What'd you buy? He's like, I just, you know, my friend didn't have lunch money, and my other friend didn't have this, my other friend, and he just gives everything away. The other day, someone gave him $20, and I said, what do you do first? He goes, well, you tie that, obviously. And so he set aside the $2. This is tied. So what are you going to do with the other 18? How are you going to manage that? He said, you know what? Let's just give it all to Jesus. And I was like, oh, how precious, how sweet. I mean, it's just like his heart for Jesus. And I said, well, why do you want to give it all to him? Because you'll buy me whatever I want. <laughs> we haven't quite learned stewardship yet, have we? And, and here's where it really hit home. We were at Target the other day, and... You know, he saw this toy that he wanted, and he's like, let's buy the toy. I said, well, you don't have enough allowance right now to buy it, and, and I don't have any money right now to buy it because I've spent all my money for the week. He said, well, Dad, just put it on our credit card. We'll pay for it later. You're 10 years old. Who taught you about credit cards? I'm telling you, man, the devil's out there. He, he, he is real, and he wants you in bondage, and he wants you in slavery, and he will start young. I mean, my 10-year-old kid already understands, you know, debt and slavery and, and, and the bondage to credit cards, and, but he has no idea how bad and unhealthy it is. I mean, it's very real. We, we got to start figuring out what does the Bible say about this stuff? So here's the second point. Why talk about money in the church? Why talk about money in the church? First thing, let's look at the church. Let's look at the church. Why, why the church? Well, Here's why the word church is in this statement. The word church is, is, I could say, why talk about money in Christianity? But we're not talking about money in Christianity. We're talking about money in the church. Why? Because the New Testament assumes, like if you, if you study and read the New Testament, it assumes that you are an active part of a local church. Now, here's the problem. We live in a generation today where people say, well, I don't, I don't need to commit to any one church to be a Christian. I'm part of the universal church. Like, I can just kind of float around and visit this church for a while and visit this church, and I don't need to commit to any church. I don't need to... <laughs> Have you not read the Bible? Like, that's my question, because it's like you can't do more than half of the New Testament if you're not committed to, to a local body, to a local church. Like, there's no such thing in the Bible as, in, you know, being in part of the big C universal. It, no, we're, God, we're all part of the church, but God plants us in bodies, in families, in communities. Very, very clear. Let, let me show you what Jesus said in Revelation 2, verse 1. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And if you keep reading, he goes on to talk specifically to seven different churches. Why didn't Jesus just write one letter that they could all share? You see, if this whole idea of universal church was, was biblical, Jesus would have wrote one letter that they all could have shared. But it's not. Jesus wrote to seven different churches because he assumes that all of us have found our church, my church. Like, what, Where are you committed? And if you're not committed, who's your spiritual authority? Who are you submitted to? Who's speaking into your life? Who, who has the power to, to correct you and help you and encourage you if you're not committed anywhere? And, and let me be clear, it does not have to be this church. It doesn't have to be Coastline. There are great churches in North County. You need, for your sake, for your spiritual journey, somewhere where you can say, this is my church. Because life's not about us. Here's what Paul says in Romans. In Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Do you realize you belong to me and I belong to you? We belong to each other. Like I have rights to your life, you have rights to my life. We're, we're a family, we're committed, we're connected, we belong to each other. And this is how Christianity works. David says this in Psalm, he said, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon 
planted in the house of the Lord. Let me ask you, if we can be honest today, does that resemble your relationship with your church? Is your relationship with your church, does the word planted, does does that kind of summarize your relationship with your church, or is it more frequented, attended, visited? Like, like what, what does your relationship with your church look like? Those who are frequent the house of God, those who visit the house of God, those who attend the house of God, or are you planted in your, and again, it doesn't have to be this church, but it needs to be somewhere for your sake, that you are planted. And he goes on to say, the people who are planted will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, and they will stay fresh and green. That's what I want my old age to look like. I want to be planted. Now, now that's why church. Why money? Why money? Why are we talking about money in church? And I know some of you, like your skin crawls every time you know, a pastor says the word money in church. So let's, let's, just, let's just break the ice right now. Just lean over to your neighbor and say, he said money in church. <laughs> the pastor said money. And I, I, know, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. You know, let's just get the elephant out in the open. It's hard when a pastor talks about money. I get the fact that there have been many pastors who've abused money, stolen money, misused money, mishandled money. But can I tell you, that is the minority. That is the exception, not the rule. There are more good pastors than there are bad pastors. And anywhere you find humans, you're going to find failure, and you're going to find sin, and you're going to find mistakes. But can I tell you, there are are many more good pastors who've handled money well than they are bad pastors who've gotten a bad reputation for stealing, mismanaging, and mishandling God's money. So let's not throw it all out. So so why talk about money? Well, let me ask you a question. I don't want to be ugly about this, but let me just ask this question. Have you ever read the Bible? I mean, the Bible talks a lot about money, like more than any other subject. I was reading in Forbes magazine this week. This is not a Christian publication. This is Forbes. And they were interviewing Peter Grandich, who's the author of Confessions of a Wall Street Whiz Kid. The title of the article said, Is the Bible the Ultimate Financial Guide? Here's what he says. He goes, I get my financial guidance from the Bible. Money and possessions are the second most referenced topic in the Bible. Money is mentioned more than 800 times, and the message is clear. Nowhere in Scripture is debt viewed in a positive way. He goes on to say that that through his years as a highly successful Wall Street stockbroker, it left him spiritually depleted and clinically depressed. He says the Bible, he found, was an excellent financial advisor, whether you're religious or not. The writers of the Bible anticipated the problems we would have with money and possessions. There are more than 2,000 references to money and possessions in the Bible. Our whole culture is now built on the premise that we have to have more and more stuff to feel happy and secure. And I love this. He says, public storage is the poster child for what's wrong with America. (laughs) We have too much stuff because we bought into the myth fabricated by Wall Street and Madison Avenue that more stuff equals more happiness. He says that's the total opposite of the truth and the opposite of what it says in the Bible. He says the number one most important rule in the Bible, God owns everything. You may have bought that house, but he gave you the money to buy it, so it is his. It's his. I mean, think about this. How did the Bible know? Have you ever wondered that? How did the Bible know? Like, Like, it was written thousands of years ago. How did they know our number one issue today would be money? somehow they knew thousands of years ago that the issue is still going to be the issue. And it dealt with this predominantly in Scripture. Think about this. Every single time, every time you see people worshiping in the Bible, every time they brought an offering. They never worshiped in the Bible without bringing an offering. Let me ask you, do you bring an offering every time you worship God? Because every single time in the Bible they worship God, they brought an offering. God commanded offerings. God's the one who set up the tithe. There are 500 verses in the Bible about prayer. There are less than 500 about faith. There are over 2,000 on money. Jesus actually talked about it more than me. Like, if you don't like me preaching about money, you would have hated Jesus being your pastor. 16 out of 38 parables had to do with money. So let's just ask the question, was Jesus trying to get their money? Let Let me actually bring it home. 
Am I trying to get your money? Let's just ask the question, because I know you're thinking it. Am I here today trying to get your money? Here's the truth. We don't need your money. God is our provider. We're building a $9 million children and youth building right now without a capital campaign and without a fundraiser. And I know you're thinking, well, that's because of the money that we have given you. No, it's because of the money God has provided us. God may have used you, but it was his money. Let's, let's be clear about that. And I would be very careful to ever consider any of the money in your bank account yours because God will let you know pretty quickly whose it is. <laughs> God is the owner. We are the steward. The reason we're doing this series is I'm tired of seeing people dying in financial stress. I'm tired of seeing it killing marriages. I'm tired of seeing people lose sleep, having health issues. And let me say, I know a lot of pastors, when they talk about money, they get very apologetic and they get very timid and shy. I'm not one of them. Obviously, the only reason a pastor would ever be apologetic about money is two reasons. One, they don't believe the Bible is true, or two, they don't love people. Only, only two possible reasons. Because if you believe the Bible is true and you love people, then you teach on money. Because the Bible teaches on money more than any other subject in the Bible. Because the Bible understood this was going to be the biggest issue we deal with today. So, so the question, is Jesus trying to get your money? No, Jesus is trying to get your heart. That's why he taught about it so much. Here's what he says. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's not the other way around. See, a lot of people think that what you have a heart for is what you give money towards. It doesn't work that way. What you give money towards is where you have a heart. Think about it. You invest money in a stock, and all of a sudden, you become very interested in that company. You could have cared less what that company was doing last week, but now that you got money in that company, you're checking every day, oh, do they have a CEO change? What's going on? Like You're very interested in how that company is being run once you put some money into it. You could have cared less a week ago, but now that there's money involved, your heart's involved. Why? Because your heart follows your money, not the other way around. So if you want a heart for the things of God, you got to put money in the things of God. If you want a heart for missions, you put money in missions. If you want a heart for evangelism, you put money in ev- And all of a sudden, you become interested in what you're invested in. And, and this, is, this is clearly where Jesus... And this, that's why the first thing that you teach a brand new Christian is tithing. Why? Because if you teach a brand new Christian to give their heart to God, God can deal with every area of their life. And then here's the final reason why we're going in this series, is because we're called to be blessed to be a blessing. There's two reasons God wants to bless you. One, because he loves you. God's crazy about you. He adores you. He has a heart for you. He loves you. But there's a second reason God wants to bless you, because he wants you to be a blessing. He's he's got something for you to do. He wants you to make a difference with your life. There's a huge need in the world, and he's given you some of the supply, and he's trying to channel it through you. And so let me just take a moment and say, look, there there is nothing wrong with wanting to live in a safe neighborhood. There's nothing wrong with wanting your kids to go to a better school. There's nothing wrong with wanting a house that's big enough for each of the kids to have their own bedroom. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You've heard me say this before. I don't believe any one of us should ever feel guilty about the blessing on our life, the blessing of where we live, the blessing of what God is. None of us should ever, but we should feel responsible. We should never feel guilty, but we absolutely should feel responsible. And so I want to close with two very obscure verses in the Bible. Two two very short, tiny, obscure verses in the Old Testament that people have written entire books off of just these two verses. It's in 2 Chronicles 4, 1 Chronicles 4. There's a guy named Jabez. We only have two. It never mentions this guy again in the Bible, just two verses. It says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Now, the Bible wouldn't make a statement like that if it wasn't going to explain why. So the Bible is going to tell you why he was more honorable. What made him more honorable than his brothers? Jabez is more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Remember, Bible names mean something. His name means pain. He had a hard life. His life was not easy. He went through tragedy. He went through heartache. He went through pain. We know that because of his name. The Bible would not point that detail out to us if his life was easy. He had a hard life. But he was more honorable than his brothers. What made him more honorable than his brothers? What did he do different than his brothers? Well, we only know one thing that he did. He only did one thing. And it's this one thing that made him more honorable. What was the one thing he did? He prayed a prayer to God. 
a very unusual prayer. Here, here's, here's what it says. Jabez, next verse, cried out to the God of Israel. Here's the prayer. This is the only thing we know he did differently than his brothers is he prayed this prayer and God called him honorable for praying this prayer. He said, oh, that you would bless me. So we have so much unhealthy teaching in the church that we shouldn't pray prayers like that. You shouldn't ask God to bless you. You shouldn't ask God to prosper you. You shouldn't ask God to make you successful. You need to be poor and live in poverty. That's what holiness looks like. And God calls this kid honorable, and the only thing we know he does is he says, God, bless me. Bless me. God, bless me. And the Bible is not teaching us materialist or or selfishness right now, because there's a purpose to blessing. He says, bless me and enlarge my salary, enlarge my career, enlarge my company, enlarge my territory, my property, my wealth, my estate. And you're thinking, man, he prayed that and God called him honorable? Absolutely. God is looking for people to pray this prayer. Why? Because God sees a major need in the world and he has the supply and he needs somebody to move the supply to the need. And so he's looking for an honorable person who'll say, God, bless me because I want to be a channel to move the supply to the need. He's looking for people to pray that. And then he says, let your hand be with me. Like, I want your presence. If you're going to bless me, I want you in my life. And keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Let me read that another way. Let me be a blessing to people and not a harm to people. Let me not bring pain to people's life. Let me bring blessing to people's life. Because God has called us to be a blessing. Bless me, God. Bless me, God. Bless me, God. How did God respond to this prayer? God granted his request. That's all we know about Jabez. Something about that prayer caught God's attention that out of all the people in the Old Testament, he recorded those two verses for our behalf. I think personally God likes that prayer. And I think personally God would love to answer that prayer for you. God is just looking for somebody honorable who'll pray it. In fact, if you... you, When you leave today, if you stop by our our Next Steps table, we have prayer guides that we give out for free at all of our prayer meetings. It's a little black prayer booklet, and the prayer of Jabez is in there, and it'll teach you how to pray that prayer over your life. It'll give you an outline for how to pray. Pick up one today and start praying it this week, because God likes that prayer, and he'd love to answer it for you. Let 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 me illustrate it like this. We bought a home in Mexico a couple years ago. For the, for the children that we have the privilege of caring for in Mexico. Many of you gave generously for the home. We didn't ask for money. We just let the church know what was happening. And uh, many people just on their own decided to give and gave generously. While many people were giving, there were a number of you, and I saw this happen, a number of you prayed this prayer, and you asked me to pray with you. You said, would you pray that God would bless this investment so we can give more? You were already giving what you had. But you began to pray... let's pray that God will bless this investment. Let's pray that God will bless this opportunity. Let's pray that God will bless my career. Let's pray that I'll get a raise because we're giving, but I I think we can give more. It wasn't this, you know, I'm not giving anything, so I'm praying for God to bless me and I'll give God a part. That's not, that's not what we're, don't do that with God. I know a lot of people don't give anything and they say, well, God, if you'll bless this opportunity, then I'll give you a portion of it. And that's manipulation. These people were already givers, and they said, God, bless what I'm involved with so I can give more. Now, let me ask you a question. The people who were praying for God to bless this investment, bless their career, bless their business, was that wrong? Was that wrong for them to ask God to bless an investment opportunity so that they could give more? No. This is God's heart. This is God's desire. He wants us to live blessed. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. So, so here's why I say it's so important to be responsible. Let me, let me close with this verse. Paul in Romans 14 says, remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, let me help you with this because a lot of Christians are scared of this. The judgment seat of God is not negative. If you are a Christian, if you've committed your life to Jesus, you're going to stand before God, but it's not a negative judgment where God's going to pull out a list of all of your sin. There are a lot of Christians who are scared to death that they're going to stand before God and God's going to get all of their sin out. And it's going to be this long list of all the bad things they've ever done and they're going to have to go through it one by one on the judgment seat. That will never happen as a Christian. 
The Bible says God has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. You are forgiven. He has chosen to forget it. You will never have to stand before God as a Christian and go through your sin. This is a positive judgment. In fact, the Greek word for judgment, see, is bima. It's where we get the Olympic pedestal. If you've ever been to the Olympics, when any event is over, there is a judgment. One athlete is judged gold, one athlete is judged silver, one athlete is judged bronze. That is what this is. It's a positive judgment. It has nothing to do with the bad things in your life. It has nothing to do with your sin. You're never going to have to, to stand judgment for your sin, the Bible says. This is a judgment for your generosity. It's a judgment for the difference you made after you found Christ. It's a judgment for your stewardship. That's what this is. Because it goes on to say, for Scripture says, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account. I will stand before God and I'm going to give a personal account of what I did with my generosity. I'm going to give a personal account of what I did with my stewardship, what I invested in, the difference I made for the kingdom. And this judgment is either going to be really, really quick or it's going to take a while. I don't know about you, I want mine to take a while. I don't want to be on the platform quickly. Like, I, I want there to be a list that unfolds. I won't be there for a while because I lived a generous life. Because I lived a life where I made a difference. I lived a life where I was a good steward. I got out of debt so that I could give more. See, when my wife and I were struggling in debt, we couldn't be generous the way we wanted to be generous. Because our generosity was being eaten up in credit card payments. See, when we made the tough decision to handle money God's way and get out of debt and take those steps, all of a sudden we've been put in a position where we could be far more generous today than we ever could before. And so I don't want you to feel any shame, but as we leave today, let's ask the question, what will your personal account look like? When you're standing on that Olympic pedestal and you're being judged, gold, silver, or bronze, what's it going to look like for you? Where's your stewardship generosity account going to unfold. And if it doesn't look good right now, take a step, get honest. I know that there's, there's sometimes pride and shame, but let's take a step. Let's get honest. And, and we'd love to help you. We, we got people who are committed to working with you, either privately or in groups, to help you take the steps you need to get this, this chain off of your neck that is healing you. Chain of debt and just financial stress that's killing you. It doesn't have to be that way. There is another way that we're going to show you throughout this series, God's way. And it's totally different. Would you close your eyes? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you that thousands of years ago, you knew our biggest issue today was still going to be money. And you taught us, Lord, steps that we can take to not allow money to rule over us, but for us to rule over money on your behalf so that we can live the life and make the difference you've called us to live. So let us, God, be good stewards of everything you've entrusted to us. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? We're going to close with one song. During this song, our prayer team is going to be available. If you're not a Christian today, you've never committed your life to Christ, I would encourage you today, come talk to somebody on our prayer team. This is a great day. That The number one thing God wants from you is your heart. He, he, he loves you so much. He would love for you to be a part of his family. I want to invite you to come pray with someone today. Uh, if any part of this message hit a nerve, take a first step and pray with someone today. If something else is going on in your life, just take a step and pray with somebody today. We're going to sing this song, and then we'll be closed.